UFC 263. These are the full card predictions and the betting preview. Adesanya and Vittori rematch in the main event. Exciting rematch in the co-main event. Davison Figueiredo and Brandon Moreno. You got Nate Diaz and Leon Edwards in the first ever featured bout five rounder this card's fantastic cannot wait to talk about it we'll start it all the way off at the bottom with the early prelims and work our way to that main event so make sure you guys smash that like button goal on this video 100 likes subscribe if you guys are new here and let's start it off first fight of the night all the way down low at the bottom carlos philippe versus jake collier heavyweight matchup here interesting matchup right because collier at one point was a pretty shredded out 205er and now he's a obese heavyweight it's insane how the uh change of the physique for collier in the last fight he fought jean Vellante. he looked okay he had decent moments he's not a bad kickboxer jay collier i mean especially when you look at him in his prime you know down a weight class he was pretty decent but up a weight class He's fighting Carlos Philippe, who's a tricky fight. I mean, if you look on the side of Philippe, the guy's an entertaining fighter. That Tafa fight was fantastic. Decent boxing skills, and he does fight pretty well from that mid-range. Decent straight right hand as well. That's something to note. For me, I got to give Philippe some credit, too, for winning a round against Spivak. That was a majority decision, and Sergey Spivak is pretty good. Collier, not near that level. He's... A chubby heavyweight, but he is a bit of a natural athlete. I feel like he definitely starts to fatigue towards the end of the first, or excuse me, the end of the second round. You look back at that John Vellante fight, he was definitely getting tired. Carlos Felipe is going to put him on him here. I think Collier might be able to be competitive in that first round and a half. Felipe takes over. Decision victory, unanimous decision for the moderate favorite here in Carlos Felipe. Odds officially for that matchup. Let's see, sitting around minus 190 to plus 165. Fight goes the distance play at minus 125 isn't a terrible one for that. Uh, but I do like Carlos Philippe to win the fight. And the odds have shrunk a little bit. And I think Philippe is a pretty good pick because he should beat Jay Collier without a, a doubt here. It is going to be Philippe winning this fight. Easy, easy enough fight to call, I believe, in that one. So we'll go with Philippe. The next fight. Faraz Ziam versus Luigi Venderimi, lightweights and also the Italian Stallion. Gotta love the nickname, uh, knocking off the legendary Rocky Balboa here. In the last fight for Venderami, he got a big knockout over a guy in Jesse Ayari who had not been stopped against Darren Till and other decent competition, and he was out quick. Granted, down a weight class, he was previously at 170. The chin was probably affected still. Venderami does have some legit striking skills. I would say he's a good kickboxer, a lot of lateral movement, and his head movement is also pretty good as well. Knockout power is definitely there. Does have some pop in the hands, got some looping hooks that he'll throw. Definitely has some speed on them as well on the other side for us Ziyam a lot taller and longer 6'1 versus 5'8 only a two inch reach advantage though but from kickboxing range the legs will have a fair amount of length advantage on the side of Ziyam He's a pretty solid kickboxer in his own right. Some nasty leg kicks, and he does like to counter a lot off that back foot. Has that height and reach advantage, also some decent wrestling. The thing is, Ziam is a decision fighter. The way he wins this fight is decision, whereas Venderami, more nasty, more ruthless. He's going to come inside looking for big shots. I think that we're going to see Venderami actually get the knockout in the second round. I got to go with the fellow Italian. I got to go with the Italian stallion, Luigi Venderami, to win this fight. Knockout in round number two. He's a close money dog here at the minus 105. Let's see if that's still accurate at the moment. Minus 115, minus 105. So pretty much pickums here. Um, and there's not really a ton of bets. Under two and a half is plus two, or excuse me, plus 145. Maybe some value on that. But I do like the straight bet on Venderami more. And I do think he gets a TKO win in the second round. If Zayam were to win it, it's going to be uh, more outside. A lot of movement. Probably not the most entertaining fight in him getting a decision. But I think Luigi comes inside and knocks him out. Second round win for Luigi Venderami in this matchup. Some early prelim action here. Some decent fights. Um, and I do think we're, we're going to see a finish in that Venderami one. Next bout, you got Chase Hooper. Striking-wise, not good. On the other side, Steven Peterson is by no means a world beater, but he's not necessarily a bad fighter. You look back at his fight against Alex Caceres, I mean, there was decent moments. He definitely had a better fight against Caceres at moments than Chase Hooper did. 
Hooper is also a southpaw, which can be tricky for some guys. He's pretty lanky, 6'1", 75 and a half inch reach, but he just doesn't have stand-up skills. He's not a striker at all. He's pretty much a pure grappler. Hands are slow. Footwork is slow. Striking-wise, no threat. On the ground is where he's a threat, but Steven Peterson's never been submitted before. So now to go in and take on the 21-year-old Chase Hooper, I think odds are Steven Peterson doesn't get tapped. He has a striking advantage, a bit hittable with straights, but as I said, no striking coming at him with Chase Hooper. I think this is going to be the unpredictable striker, Steven Peterson. I'd consider him an unpredictable striker, especially after that spinning back fist knockout of Martin Bravo in the, in the last one. I'm going with Steven Peterson to win. I think that he ends up getting it done by a decision. Um, I think it's potentially an odd fight because I do think Hooper will get a hold of him a bit and try to clinch up, maybe try to get the back, but I think Peterson fends it off. Decision victory, Steven Peterson, but kind of a weird fight here. Is a bet all that valid? Pickham's money now because money has definitely come down on Chase Hooper. Personal opinion, lean you towards prop betting Hooper by a submission when the props come out. We'll do the best bets video when it does, and we'll do the full betting breakdown. But for the predictions here, I'm skipping the bet still on this fight straight. I would rather maybe prop it up with a Hooper submission, even though I'm not picking him to win. I don't think there's a ton of... Uh, ton of hype on Steven Peterson, and I think that Hooper could catch him in something. Skip the bet on this one, but I think Steven Peterson for the unanimous decision win here. Let's get to the next fight of the night. Matt Frivola, the steamroller, versus Frank Camacho. Camacho beaten up badly against Justin Janes in the last fight. Before that, Benil Dariush easily beat him. But Benil Dariush has now turned out to be one of the top lightweights on the planet. So really no shame for Frank Camacho there. It's not that Camacho is necessarily a bad fighter, um, but has been beaten four out of his last five has been knocked out, um, and in three of his last losses, has been finished each and every time. Frivola on the other side, pretty decent fighter. What was the last one? It was against Saruki, and that's a terrible matchup. I'm on Saruki and an animal. I mean, things to like for Frivola. A lot of movement, definitely likes to sit down and throw power punches, and definitely has some pop in that overhand. Camacho, hittable, especially the older he's gotten. A lot of tough losses. It seems like Camacho's going out, whereas Frivola is maybe maintaining himself as like a journeyman contender, veteran. I mean, at the end of the day, he did beat Violent Bob Ross and Jalen Turner. I feel like Frivola, better guy here between these two. I do think if he lets the hands fly, he can knock out Frank Camacho in the second round. That's going to be my pick, knockout win for Frivola. But I could also see a decision. Odds around the minus 200 range. We will see exactly what they're sitting at here. Minus 200 to plus 170. The props released right now. Fight goes the distance. It definitely could. Under 2.5 plus 120. Um, as of right now, I think Frivola is a parlay play i do think he's worth it in the parlays if you guys are going to be playing some because he really should beat frank camacho who's just not looked good as of late so we're going with frivola he should win this fight and he should do it by knockout in the second round over frank camacho what's the next fight here penny kianzad and alexis davis this fight could potentially really suck i'll be 100 percent honest it could be davis holding grinding clinching and just a boring fighter stand-up's not very good it's okay at best i guess you would say um definitely more of a wrestler if she finds a way to get it to the floor she definitely can win the fight penny kianzad on the other side win over sajara eubanks granted in that fight she was put on her back a fair amount some solid striking with some decent hands or straight punches are really nice but the better wrestlers can get a hold of her and take her down Tricky one to pick here, right? You got the 36-year-old who was recently on a three-fight losing streak, but let's be honest, she loses decisions. She's not getting finished. Penny Kianzad has a decision loss to Julia Vila, but three-fight winning streak for her. The recent fight against Eubanks is a pretty decent win. On the other side, Davis beats Sabina Mazow. It's one of those fights where I don't really love a bet. It's women's MMA, um, and it's also this women's bantamweight division here. Girls that are really towards the back end of it. Alexis Davis, at this point, 36. I remember when Ronda Rousey beat her in like 15 seconds. 
Kianzad on the other side, minus 220 favorite. Is she able to win this fight? I think if she keeps it on the feet, she really can win. I just have this fear that Alexis Davis will eventually get towards the takedown. Still, I'll pick P Penny Kianzad on a decision, but there may be some value in an Alexis Davis win by decision prop bet. It's, I don't think, out right now, but I do think betting-wise, that might be a decent one. Let's see. If we can find the Alexis Davis fight here with Penny. Plus 180, minus 220. Yeah, there's there's no real props there. Fight does go the decision. I think is pretty much a lock. It's already at minus 320. Over two and a half, minus 375. Penny Kayanzad should squeak by with a decision. Don't love a bet on this fight. It's women's MMA and it's lower level women's bantam weights. But I gotta go with the young Kianzad. Wrong side of 35 for Davis. Hasn't looked great as of late. The wrestling is decent, but Kianzad beat a proven grappler in Sajara Eubank. So for me, I'm going Pani Kianzad decision win over the old Alexis Davis at this point. Let's get up to the next fight. Who's next here? Hakim Duwadu and Movzar Evolev. You look at Evolev's last fight, he had a really difficult time versus Nick Lentz. And that's not that Nick Lentz, he's not a bad fighter. Nick Lentz is a decent guy, pretty good wrestling. Makes it tricky for guys, especially strikers like Evolev, who do have decent grappling games, but more defensive. Um, and he was put up against the cage a good amount by Lentz, but he did piece up Lentz with some good punches. Like, let's let's give him credit. He, he definitely did some damage. On the other side, Duedo, close fight against Zuberia Togugov there. In this fight here, speed advantage, I feel, is definitely in the favor of Hakeem Duedo. Technical striker, he's definitely pretty patient as well, and his hands are good, and from the mid-range, very dangerous. On the other side, Evloev has some decent grappling when he gets the opportunities, and really, the guy does not tap. It looked like Nick Lentz had that guillotine locked in. He's a pretty good striker, and he definitely likes to come inside with those nice straight punches, decent kicks from range. In this matchup here, though, I got a lean split decision. I got to go with the faster guy. I'm going Hakeem Duwe to a split decision win over Movzar Evloev. He will give him his first defeat. I think he's due for a first loss. He's unbeaten, and I don't necessarily think he's world class just yet. Only 27. Sky is the limit. But I'm going Hakeem Duwe to win a split decision in this fight, and he's the plus 200 dog. I'm surprised they're this widespread. It's not like Evloev really is that impressive. You look at his wins, he's not that impressive. He doesn't finish anybody. Granted, on the other side, Duedu doesn't finish anybody either, so pretty close fight, and I do think Duedu squeaks by with a split decision. Odds right now, fight goes the distance, minus 215, maybe some value in that, but I like the dog play in Hakeem Duedu, and I think he gets a very close split decision win over Movzar Evloev in this featherweight matchup. I think the next fight, is it is it the featured prelim? Up next, no, we still got a couple more prelims. Oh, wow, we, we got a lot of fights on this card. What is this? This is a 14-fight card, so there's a good amount of action. Up next, we're talking about Lauren Murphy versus JoJo Calderwood. This is a good matchup between these girls. Murphy on one side is on a roll. Four fights in a row. If she wins, she's getting a title shot. Even though a lot of people probably not the biggest fans of Murphy. Scrappy fighter with all right stand-up. Definitely has that pressure forward style. She'll beat a good amount of girls. Beat uh, Shakarovov, I believe, in the last fight. Yeah, it was Shakarova. It was an up-and-coming girl, 8-1. and one. Didn't have much of a shot against Lauren Murphy, who definitely the bigger girl had the better pressure, physically stronger. Submission win there. She does have some decent submissions in the arsenal. On the other side, JoJo Calderwood, way more technical of the striker. She's got that tie esque style of striking. Some pretty nice front, front kicks up the center she'll throw. Um, and she does fight pretty well from that mid-range. I like JoJo. She's younger. She's not longer. She is an inch taller, though, so the legs will have a slight length advantage. I just don't think Lauren Murphy has all that much technical striking skill, and I think JoJo does. So this is kind of a, a perfect matchup for her to shine here. I think decision win for JoJo Calderwood, and she may now earn, finally, that world title shot against Valentina Shevchenko because who the hell else is there at that women's flyweight division? I guess it's Lauren Murphy. Winner of this fight, probably fighting for a world title in this weight class. I am riding with JoJo Calderwood to get the win in this fight slight favorite very slight odds have her at minus 145 but you can find her at plus money where's this betway has her at plus money i throw money down for plus as far as if she's like a minus 150 favorite i don't think it's necessarily worth it there um, but i do think this fight goes the distance and the play on that minus 305 not the best value but 
a bit of it there. I'm going with Joanne Calderwood. If you can get her at the dog, absolutely play her. If you get her as the favorite, it's women's MMA, which comes with the most risk, especially this women's flyweight division. But I'm going with JoJo Calderwood, and she should be a good-to-go play and get the win by a decision over Lauren Murphy. Next fight, the rematch, but it's at 205. Eric Anders versus Darren Stewart. The first fight at 85. Stewart was landing some nice punches from range. Then Anders started putting the pressure on him. Clearly physically stronger. Darren Stewart didn't like that pressure. He got hurt bad by some punches. Then the illegal knee ends up landing, and then we get a no contest. So they're running it back. It's up a weight class. Honestly, Darren Stewart is pretty jacked, but he's really not the biggest middleweight, and now he's going up to 205. This is Eric Anders' fight. I'm going Eric Anders to get the win. I think that it will be another fight similar to the first, but Anders now knows the weakness in the game is Darren Stewart against the cage. Anders will look to pressure. He'll look to put Stewart's back up against the cage. And I do think we see Eric Anders with a knockout. Now, Stewart does have some pretty good striking when he's in the center. So I really feel like Anders is going to look to clinch up from the start. He knows now. He's naturally bigger. He's physically stronger. He gets a TKO here, but I do think second round TKO. I feel like Stewart might be able to survive that first round enchilat there. But Eric Anders, my only fear is if this man goes too crazy for the stoppage in the first and gasses himself out. Granted, didn't look super tired after he had beaten up Darren Stewart a bit in the last fight with the no contest. So I feel like Eric Anders, he's going to get a knockout win. Second round here, it's going to be against the cage. I'm going Eric Anders for the victory. He is the favorite. That first fight, he was the dog, I believe. And now the rematch, he turns out to be a nice little favorite here. Makes sense. He was en route to victory. Plus 125, minus 145. The props fight doesn't go the distance. Minus 185. That's a decent one if you don't want to pick a winner. But I think Eric Anders should win. And it's going to be pretty clear cut because Darren Stewart against the cage, not that great. And Eric Anders, pretty decent against the cage. I got him winning the fight. Physically stronger, bigger, up a weight class. This is Eric Anders' fight all day long here. Let's get to the next one. Prelim bout. Drew Dober versus Brad Riddell. On one side, you got Drew Dober who... Was on a nice streak, three in a row. Nasrat Hakparas knockout win, Polo Reyes, uh, Alexander Hernandez. And then he runs into Islam Mahachev, who's the scariest prospect in that lightweight division. On the other side, Brad Riddell, a damn hot prospect too in that lightweight division. He's a pretty good fighter. His Muay Thai is really where he shines. He's got excellent kickboxing, trains with those city kickboxing guys. His only pro loss, I'm 99% sure, is to Alexander Volkanovsky. No, it isn't. Okay, different guy. Mixing him up. Um, but he did lose to Abel Bryce. That was in Hex Fight Series. So not the same guy. That, that was a mix-up. But I know off the top of my head, I can't think of who it is. But somebody that's training with Volk now fought him in the past. It's not Brad Riddell. Riddell's a pretty good striker, though. And from what I've seen of Riddell, technically superior to Drew Dober. Now, height-wise, he's an inch shorter, but does have that one-inch reach advantage. Southpaw Drew Dober, who is a powerhouse. He's very physically strong. Not the best wrestler, but... He's, he's an animal with his punching power. His legs are humongous, and he's a southpaw. Could be a bit tricky for Riddell, but I got to go with the more technical guy in Brad Riddell to get the win in this fight. I do think his left hook straight right combo will definitely get some work done here, and his low kicks will be chopping away at Drew Dober. The southpaw stance could potentially see a straight left land on the chin of Riddell, but I feel like he has enough striking experience to win this fight. I got Brad Riddell, the more technical fighter, winning a decision, and he is an underdog. Plus money. Let's see what he's sitting at. Brad Riddell is plus 110 to minus 130, plus 115. You can even find him at. I like Brad Riddell to win this fight, and I think he's worth a play as a dog here. So we're going dog on this fight with Brad Riddell. I think he wins it, and I think he does so by a decision over Drew Dober here. Excited to see this matchup because I think Brad Riddell is a pretty bright prospect in that lightweight division as far as strikers do go. Um, he's not a grappler by any means but at the end of the day isn't terrible on the ground trains with a good team over at city kickboxing and now we're moving up to that main card so if you guys have not yet make sure you guys smash that like button as i said go 100 likes on this video let's get to this main card it's paul craig versus jamal hill to start it off this is an exciting matchup here I'm really excited to see Sweet Dreams Jamal Hill back again. He knocked out OSP in the last fight. On the other side, you got the Bear Drew Paul Craig. He got a win over Shogun Hua. Prior to that, also beat Gazermat into Gulov. Hot prospect on one side with Jamal Hill. 
decent staple light heavyweight who's started to really improve and definitely start to make a bit of a name for himself here at 33, did Paul Craig, but he's taken on a young kid who I feel like is really on the rise. Let's talk about Jamal Hill. He's a southpaw, and southpaws are tricky, especially when they have the speed of Jamal Hill. Good boxing skills from the mid-range. Has decent reach, 79 inches, 6 feet, 4 inches tall, so I'd consider him a pretty rangy striker. That left hand is clean, and if he touches your chin, he can hurt you. He definitely has precise punching power. Good tie clinch. I would consider him to be a special prospect. On the other side, Paul Craig. Decent striking skill. Pretty tall guy himself, 6'3", 76-inch reach. Doesn't have that same explosiveness. Not super fast, but, uh, I mean, he isn't a bad striker. On the ground, he really does shine, though. He's dangerous with his Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Some good submission wins. From range, he does fight well on the feet. I think in this matchup, he's going to look to get inside and try to get Jamal Sweet Dreams Hill to the ground. He will not be able to do that. I think Jamal Hill is going to knock him out in the first round. Really evident speed advantage. You're going to notice it probably in the first 35 seconds. Jamal Hill's going to land counters. Being the southpaw, he's going to give issues to Paul Craig. Craig will look to get inside. He's going to get cracked. I see him getting knocked out in the first round. I see it in the first four minutes. It could be around the 330 mark if you want like a crazy mystic Mac pick. But I see Jamal Hill knockout win in the first round. And he moves forward as a fun prospect. He's a strong favorite. And I think he's a guy you want to add to your parlays. I think he's a lock. Minus 280 to plus 240. Jamal Hill for the victory, guys, and he's getting a finish. As of right now, fight doesn't go the distance. It's minus 335. They know it's not gonna. Jamal Hill knockout prop bet will have value. Jamal Hill straight on your parlays will have value. Jamal Hill is the play. He's gonna win, and he's gonna knock out Paul Craig in the first round. Keep your eye on Jamal Hill as a prospect. Next fight, Damian Maya, Bilal Muhammad. Bilal gets a huge chance here. He's fighting one of... The best grapplers in MMA ever. Maybe the best straight Brazilian jiu-jitsu practitioner in mixed martial arts history, period. The guy's submissions are special. His takedowns are, are pretty decent, but not an explosive wrestler. It's that jiu-jitsu style takedown. He'll clinch you up. He'll put you against the cage. He'll trip you. Sometimes he can land nice single legs, especially depending on the stances. He is a southpaw, so if you get an orthodox guy, that front leg's there. We saw him take down Gilbert Burns in the last fight before getting viciously knocked out. And he did have a bit of control on Gilbert. In this fight here, Bilal Muhammad, he's got some pretty good wrestling skills. And his boxing has improved a lot. Striking-wise, he's gotten way better. He's pretty quick. He's got some good movement. He's an athletic fighter. He has that pressure-forward style. I really do think he can put it on Damian Maya on the feet here. I feel like he's going to be able to defend the takedowns, at least the majority of them. If he gets put on the ground, he needs to get up fast. Because you play around on the ground too much with Damian Maya, you're in serious trouble. I think Bilal Muhammad at this point is going to get the win. I'm not picking a 43-year-old Damian Maya who just got knocked out in the last fight. And before that, he beat Ben Askren, but it's Ben Funky Askren. He beat Rocco Martin by a competitive majority decision before that. That was about two years ago. Bilal Muhammad, he gets the win here by a decision. I think that he's just... More well-rounded at this point. Doesn't have the same level of submission skills by any means, but his wrestling will hold up. His striking skill is clearly better than Damian. He might get a knockout, to be 100% honest. Damian Maya, at 43 years old, I don't know if the chin is completely gone because he was knocked out bad against Gilbert Burns. I'm going Bilal Muhammad knockout win. I think he gets it done. Or excuse me, Bilal Muhammad decision win, but I think he might get it done by a knockout if Damian's chin is gone. But I think smarter play is decision in this one. Minus 225 to plus 185. Really no props out. Fight goes the distance. Minus 165. That's okay. Over two and a half. Minus 175. Nothing worth talking about right now for props. But Bilal Muhammad should beat Damian Maya. But the price tag is too wide. I would like to see him at a minus 175. And then I would feel he's a more good to go bet. At minus 235. That's a good amount of money down. For a guy who's never fought somebody like Damian Maya. But he still should win. But Maya always dangerous by submission. I don't know what the prop will be for Damian by submission. If you get it early enough. Maybe it's... Uh, that's some good plus money. And hey, maybe Damian Maya gets a submission here and taps out Bilal. But I don't think so. I'm going Bilal Muhammad to win this fight. And I think he does it by a unanimous decision. And now we've arrived. This is the key fight. This is the real marquee fight of the night. The featured bout between Leon Rocky Edwards and Nate Diaz. What a weird matchup because Nate Diaz truly does his best work at 155. He's now up at 170 again. He doesn't like cutting weight, I understand, but this is a nightmarish matchup. You're taking on a 29-year-old contender who's only recently lost. 
was it Usman like five, six years ago? And that's not even recently. He hasn't lost recently. He's on a crazy tear. He lost to Usman the last defeat for him in 2015. Usman's a legend of the game. Been on an absolute tear since then. Realistically, should be on like, what? Is that a nine fight win streak? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. If he would have beat Bilal, but the eye poke stopped it. He was on his way to winning that fight. He was looking fantastic. This man is on a nine fight unbeaten streak. He takes on Nate Diaz on the other side, who's had some decent results, but lost the last one by cut to Masvidal over a year ago, more than a year and a half. Beating Anthony Pettis at this point has really lost its value. And then he also has that majority decision four years ago, the loss to Connor. Somehow, Nate Diaz stays a, a top fighter, even in the welterweight division, when I don't think he deserves this fight by any means. He needs to drop to 155. He's not going to find much success here. Leon Edwards is a straight killer. And stylistically, this is an awful matchup. Southpaw versus Southpaw. You have a very technically sound Leon Edwards, nasty body kicks. He's going to be chopping away at Diaz's body, which is going to actually, I think, allow him to get a finish in this fight. He's very fast, and he has a mean straight left hand. On the other side, Nate Diaz, more of a volume puncher. Definitely has some good boxing skills, but it's awkward. He's got that Stockton boxing style. Really tricky jujitsu, but it's at 155 that he does his best work. He's out muscled here against Edwards. He's going to be outstruck, outsped. Clear level advantage for Leon Edwards. This fight isn't close, and that's why the odds are so strong for Leon. I think Nate has enough durability to last some rounds. I'm going to pick third round knockout for Leon Edwards. I think he can be just the second man ever to truly knock out Nate Diaz. So I'm going with Leon to beat Nate Diaz. Maybe the Stockton legend Nate Diaz will surprise us. If he won, I would not be disappointed because, I mean, you got to love Nate Diaz. Who doesn't love Nate Diaz? He's an OG of the game. But still, I'm going Leon Edwards. Smart money's on him. Huge favorite. And he's going to get bigger and bigger as the week goes on. Minus 525 to plus 415. No props out for, you know, Diaz by submission or whatnot. I wonder what that will be sitting at. Fight goes a distance, minus 160. Fight doesn't, plus 120. I like Leon Edwards, and I think he does get a knockout win, and I think it's in that third round. I think he puts down Nate Diaz. Watch him rip in the body with kicks, and I think he lands one nice one on the chin. Probably a straight shot, and he's going to drop Nate Diaz. Leon Edwards, contender, deserves the title shot potentially after this. Depending on what goes on with that Colby Covington and Usman situation, because I know they're working on making that fight at the moment. I think that fight is probably going to happen first. Leon then has to be next, unless they want to do the Masvidal fight, which would absolutely sell as well. Leon Edwards is looking amazing. But now we're talking about this fight. It's our co-main event of the evening. Davis and Figueredo versus Brandon Moreno 2. They're running it back after an excellent first bout. What a, what a great first fight. You look at that fight, majority decision win, or excuse me, majority decision draw. Davis and Figueredo supposedly had food poisoning. He was sick, and honestly, he looked tired even towards the end of that second round. He still managed to last five rounds. At his absolute best, Davis and Figueredo is one of the scariest flyweights to ever exist in cage fighting. He's a precise striker with like some real serious knockout power. Massive hooks and excellent reflexes as well. He slips and slides out of punches at a high rate. I mean, the guy's a special fighter. And his submission skills, extremely slick. On the other side, Moreno, though, does have some really good wrestling. Could potentially land some takedowns. Animal on top and really aggressive with his ground and pound. Steel chin as well. He'll take big punches. Moreno's a savage. He's a Mexican. These guys got great chins. Physically, he's very strong. One of the strongest pound-for-pound -pound flyweights probably out there. Much improved with his striking over the years, and his jab is very solid. Two-inch reach advantage, two-inch height advantage. The bigger man, Moreno, will give Figueredo some problems with that size, with the wrestling, maybe in that first round. But here's the thing. Moreno will be in a bit of trouble now with a full 100% Figueredo. I think this is a different fight. I thought Figgy, even in that first bout, potentially could have got the decision there, even though it was considered a draw. I think Figueredo wins this fight. 49-46, unanimous decision. Should beat Brandon Moreno in this matchup, but it won't be easy. It's going to be back and forth. It's going to be competitive. And both men really need to bring their best or they could be finished here because, honestly, highest level of action in the flyweight division. This is one of the best flyweight fights that we ever saw, and now we're get, we get to see it again. The flyweight division is alive and well after the Demetrius Johnson era where there was no interest in it. Davis and Figueredo has the fans tuning in, as does Brandon Moreno. And I do believe this fight will be very entertaining as well. We might even see a third fight somewhere down the line because both these guys make for absolute fireworks. Go on, Figueredo. He's too strong of a favorite, though. I don't think at minus 245 to plus 205, he shouldn't be this big of a favorite. I really don't believe so. 
Does the fight go the distance? Minus 135, fight goes the distance. I do think it goes the distance here, and I think it's going to be Figueredo winning a decision. Unless he shows a whole new level to his game and he can go out there and stop Moreno. I just don't think that's likely. Fight's a draw, plus 5,500. I doubt it's a draw a second time. Moreno by TKO, plus 205. Excuse me, Figueredo by TKO is plus 205. Moreno by submission is plus 1,300. Moreno by TKO is plus 1,000. Massive odds there. Figueredo by submission plus 945. Guys, maybe sprinkle that. Because Figueredo does have some nasty submissions in the arsenal. And I feel like he could wrap up a neck of Moreno as he's looking for a takedown. Granted, Moreno not like most of these guys. He's a absolute savage. And that's why he was able to go five rounds and give Figueredo a toughest fight of his career. Or at least of his championship run. He's had some tough fights in the past. I am going to be going with Figueredo to win. I think this fight goes a distance. Davidson Figueredo. Let's see Figueredo by decision. What's that at? Figueredo decision plus 175. I mean, he's such a strong favorite. I don't know why he's such a big favorite. Because that first fight was a draw, you'd think it would be more like minus 150. I guess not. He probably will get wider as the week goes on. So if you're looking to bet Davis and Figueredo, do it ASAP. And I have him winning this fight against Brandon Moreto on a decision. But it will potentially be another excellent matchup. We've arrived. It's main event time. The main event of the evening, Israel Adesanya versus Marvin Vittori. If you guys haven't yet smashed that like button, let's get the 100 likes and let's talk about this fight. Israel Adesanya goes up to light heavyweight and loses. No shame. You lose to Jan Blahovitz, who's an excellent champion, extremely physically strong, excellent kickboxer, probably was one of the most underrated guys. I mean, he came into the UFC with a ton of hype, just didn't live up to it, finds a dead man hanging, keeps his rope, his career turns around, and he looks like... An absolute monster. I feel like Israel Adesanya just ran into a very difficult stylistic matchup. Especially being at that disadvantage of size. His strength was not there in that fight. He weighed in at 200. His opponent 205 at the championship weight. Adesanya was under. Vittori doesn't have that same physical strength. And he also doesn't have the, th the striking threat at all of Jan Blahovic. The competitive fight that Blahovic and Adesanya had to me is just how good Jan Blahovic is. I don't think there's anything wrong with the game of Adesanya. I think he's a long-standing champion at middleweight. But just going up a weight class when you don't fill out to that weight class and you also are taking on a man that might potentially be possessed in Jan Blahovic, it's a tricky fight. Vittori on the other side, he kind of had a trash decision win over Kevin Holland. It was a pretty boring fight. If you guys remember, it was mostly just top control. Holland was clearly the better striker, had the reach advantage by a good amount. He actually has got 83 inches of reach, I believe, or 81, one of those two. Adesanya, though, has a big reach advantage over Vittori. He's also a way better technical striker than Kevin Holland and has some serious knockout ability. He's going to chop at the legs, potentially, of Vittori. Granted, southpaw versus southpaw. So that calf kick is not going to be there unless he switches stances. He does need to avoid the takedowns here and being avoid being put against the cage. I do think we're going to see Vittori look to wrestle from the start of this fight. On the feet, clear level difference. Vittori, physically very strong. More of a grinding, grappling style. Does have a bit of power in his straight shots. But he's a grappler. That's where he shines. He's a pressure fighter that wants to get you against the cage and make it nasty, dirty, and rough. And maybe go for a submission too on Israel because we have seen some submissions in the past for Vittori. He's good on the ground. On the other side, Adesanya's an amazing striker. He's excellent on the feet. His range management is second to none. It's the best in the game. He's got really precise boxing. His leg kicks are excellent. He's a natural counter striker and he does it at an extremely good rate. Vittori gave him very much... The most difficult test, I guess, until running into Jan Blahovic in his UFC debut, for sure. He gave him a really difficult fight, was able to land some takedowns, but he didn't really do any damage. He wasn't looking for the finish. He was looking to hold in control. That's the style of Vittori. That's what we're going to see him look to do here. Adesanya has improved since that point. Vittori is going to be dominated in this fight. I don't see it being all that close. I think the first round, Vittori might have a bit of success. Adesanya is going to start figuring it out. He's definitely improved tenfold since that first fight. Vittori's gotten better too, but there's a level difference. Adesanya is greatness. Vittori is a good middleweight. Israel Adesanya is going to put a nail in the coffin of this matchup. He's going to knock out Marvin Vittori in the third round. Israel Adesanya is going to rip shots to the legs. You're going to see a ton of kicks to the body potentially? No. Actually, take that back. You know why he's not going to throw a ton of kicks to the body? The takedown threat's going to be there. But he is going to land a couple, and he's going to do some damage to Vittori when he does throw them. Look for feints. Look for shots that Vittori doesn't see coming. Israel Adesanya is going to have 
the Matrix style performance that we saw against Paulo Costa. I think he drops back to 185 with a vengeance, puts on a great performance. He's going to beat Marvin Vittori. He's a strong favorite, and I think he is one of those guys that I have some supreme confidence in. Minus 245 to plus 205. There's some props out. Under 4.5, plus 135. I think that we can see Adesanya stop him. Sure, he could circle, move, dance, and strike for five rounds, but I feel like he wants to put the nail in the coffin and drop back down to 85 and have an impressive performance. Because, I mean, he was beaten in the last fight coming off a loss he he needs to bounce back with some efficiency at plus 240 i like the price a lot there for adesanya i don't see vittori being able to get inside and take him down his striking is not at the level we're going to see a great performance by israel adesanya he beats marvin vittori knockout round number three overall we have a pretty exciting card in store for ufc 263 this won't be the only video on the card we'll also be doing the full card betting breakdown when all the props release I'm super pumped to see the action in store for us. 14 bouts. The main event's awesome. The co-main event's awesome. Every bout on this card is pretty decent. And that main card is pretty stacked with some solid names. Cannot wait to see the action coming up. Before we leave, though, I will throw one parlay at you that I am very interested in. Especially if you can get the money early. You go Jamal Hill. You go Leon Rocky Edwards. And now you're going to realistically, some of you might want to skip it, but I'm going Eric Anders. I love these three right here. Jamal Hill, Leon Edwards, and Eric Anders for plus 173. I think that's actually a really good parlay. And I think there's a lot of likelihood of success in that one. If you don't like Anders, I think Carlos Felipe is another good play. Still brings you in that plus money at plus 147. And if you want to add a dog to it, Brad Riddell brings you to plus 239. He's technically proficient and he's going to be Drew Dober in that matchup. And if you feel like you want to put the world champion at the top, I do think you can succeed on that one too. It's plus 128. We'll be going way deeper with the betting odds and the betting breakdown a little bit later on this week when all the props release. So make sure you guys stay tuned for that best bets video. Smash that like button, guys. Let's get 100 likes on this video or more. So if we're, if we're past 100, let's go way past it. Maybe you break that 150 mark. I appreciate you all so much. Thank everybody for tuning in. Subscribe to the channel if you guys are new here. Like this video. Follow my social media, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. And I will see you all in the next video.